Now, won't you turn in the scriptures to First uh, Samuel, in the Old Testament, First Samuel, chapter eight? You'll find it on page two hundred and forty-one. If you're in the front row, get a Bible from behind you. First Samuel, chapter eight, page two hundred and forty-one. A couple of weeks ago, our family spent five days at a little farm up in Dulstrom that our son and daughter-in-law have and share with seven uh, other couples. Our son Jonathan has the responsibility for the small herd of cattle on the farm that is owned uh, equally by the staff who uh, work on the farm and the shareholders uh, of the farm. And over the past few months, a few head of cattle have died and they haven't been quite sure why. And uh, when we arrived there, there was one cow that was clearly on its last legs, uh, lying uh, out in the felt. And so the the vet was called to try to get to the bottom of the problem. After carefully examining the cow externally and uh, putting it to sleep, he then decided to do an autopsy and examine her internally. And he took a very sharp scalpel and he began the task of uh, rightly dividing this cow as the family stood around, including the grandchildren. They weren't uh, squeamish at all. And uh, he opened up this animal and... uh, The internal organs were visible, and one by one, he cut them open and he examined them, trying to understand uh, what lay behind this uh, mysterious illness and the loss of a number of of the animals. And as he did his work, uh, he explained to us onlookers what each part was, uh, how it should look, how it did look. There was lots of blood and guts. I was going to show you the video, but, uh, you know, I don't like cleaning up vomit, so uh, we'll just have to leave it there. But as I watched this vet at work and as I listened to him, I thought to myself, you know, this is what I do every week. Every week, I take a passage of God's word and I begin by looking at the whole. And then I seek to rightly divide it into its parts. I seek to open it up verse by verse, bit by bit, to understand what it means, to understand how it all fits together. And then on Sunday, we come and do what they did back in Nehemiah's day. Nehemiah chapter eight, listen to this. They read from the book of the law, the word of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that people could understand what was being read. And as I looked at that vet doing his work, I thought he is exegeting this cow. And that's what we need to do with the scriptures. We need to look at the whole. We need to open it up. We need to rightly divide it and seek to understand it. And that's what we do Sunday by Sunday. By the way, that evening we ate steak, but it wasn't from that cow. So, muni warini. Now, the passage before us this morning in our study of the life of Samuel is a big cow. It's much bigger than normal. In fact, this morning, we're going to do what I don't think I've ever done before. We're going to look at four chapters. Now, Samuel was one of the great leaders of the Bible, and we're told that he judged Israel all the days of his life. And Samuel played a historically pivotal role in the nation's transition from a kind of loose confederation of tribes led by judges to a monarchy. 
the years after Israel's return to the Lord, the passage we looked at last week in chapter 7, the years after their return to the Lord uh, saw uh, victory over the Philistines and uh, a return to peace and prosperity. But there was a problem. Samuel grew old. We read that in chapter 8, verse 1. Samuel grew old. It happens to the best of us, and it happens to the worst of us. Samuel was about to step down as senior pastor, and he faced the challenge of leading the people through that change, through that transition. And that's what chapters 8 to 11 are about, and that's why we're going to look at them as one chunk rather than as separate sections. Now, the focus of these chapters is on the people and the prophet, who is Samuel, and the king, who will be introduced to us, King Saul, and sovereignly ruling over all things is Israel's covenant God, Jehovah. And so that's how we've divided this large section. We're going to look at the people who rejected the Lord, at the prophet Samuel who obeyed the Lord, and at the king Saul who at least initially served the Lord. Now, I, I could have preached a sermon on each of these chapters. In fact, it would have been a hang of a lot easier to do it that way. But what I want us to do is to look at the story and to seek to apply it, to have some, some take-home lessons for us. And may God help us do that. So let's fasten our seatbelts and get started. I want us to look, first of all, at the people who rejected the Lord. In chapter 8, we find the people, through their elders, calling for a king. And on the Lord's instruction, Samuel the prophet warns them that Having a king is going to cost them. It's going to impact their lives. Let's read from chapter 8, verse 1. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Now Samuel's appointment of his sons as judges is possibly an indication that he initially thought that they could take his place. But it soon became apparent, uh, certainly to the elders of the people, if not to Samuel, that uh, his sons were not fit for that role. Like the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, you remember, chapter two, they were not fit because they were not following in the Lord's ways. It's a sad thing when the children of believing parents don't follow in the ways of their parents, don't follow in the Lord's way. In the case of Eli, we know what Eli did wrong. We were told in chapter 3 verse 13 that his sons behaved blasphemously and he failed to restrain them. He failed to remove them from being priests. It's a little less clear as to what went wrong with Samuel's boys. We could speculate that perhaps he was away from home so much judging Israel, as we saw in chapter 7, that maybe uh, he neglected his family. And that's a, that's a problem that, that many people in Christian leadership have had, and I've certainly had to take uh, some blame on that score uh, myself. But at any rate, because of the behavior of Samuel's sons, and because the, they wanted a king to lead them in their battle against the enemies, according to verse 20, the elders came to Samuel and asked that he appoint a king over them. 
Now, I want you to notice the reactions of Samuel and the Lord to their request. Look at verse six. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. It's interesting that Samuel didn't immediately react to them. Um, that's what many of us in leadership tend to do when people suggest things that displease us. He didn't react to them. He went to the Lord and he asked the Lord's guidance. Uh, note to self there for those of us who are in leadership. And the Lord counseled Samuel not to take it personally. He said, Samuel, it's not you that they've rejected. It was actually, it's actually me they're rejecting by asking for a king. Now, how so? Why were they rejecting God by asking for a king? It's important for us to understand that the problem with the elders' proposition was not the fact that they were asking for a king, not just the fact that they were asking for a king, but that last phrase, such as all the other nations have. That seems to have been the problem with their request. The proposal about a king was actually anticipated by God. If you read back in Deuteronomy chapter 17, Back in the law, Moses anticipated the day when Israel would say, quote, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are round about me. And Moses surprisingly said that Israel should, may indeed have a king, but the king of Israel would not be like the other kings. And in Deuteronomy 17, the behavior of the king that Israel would have in the future was very clearly spelled out. And as you read that, and I wish we had time to do that, you'll realize that uh, Israel's king was to be anything but like the other kings. So the problem was not so much with the request, but with the motive. They wanted to be like the other nations. They wanted to be free of, of, of God as their king, and the Lord saw that for what it is. And that's seen in verse seven and eight. Have a look there. Where God says, they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So God saw that that's what was at the heart of it. Later on, just before uh, Samuel publicly presented Saul to them, he very politically incorrectly said to them in chapter 10, verse 18, this is what the Lord, of, the God of Israel says, I brought Israel up out of Egypt and I delivered them from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you, but you have now rejected your God who saves you out of all your calamities and distresses and have said, no, set a king over us. So God saw the motive behind their request for a king was actually their rejection of him, they're wanting to set him aside to be in every respect like the other nations. And so then on God's instruction, Samuel warned them what it would cost them as a nation to have that kind of king ruling over them. I'm not gonna take the time to read the passage, but in verses nine to 18, he spells out what it would cost them as a people to have a king over them like the kings that ruled the other nations. And the key words in verses nine to 18 are the words take and serve. Interestingly, the word take occurs six times in that section. Essentially, Samuel was warning them, you're gonna, if you have a king, you know what the king will do? He will take, 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 take. He will take your sons, he will take your daughters, he will take your land, he will take your crops, he will take your money. It'll be take, 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 take. And you will end up serving him. The king will take and you will serve. And those are the ordinary results of merely human leadership. 
whether it's in government or in business, where there is leadership that is not under the kingship of God, it invariably happens, and we are seeing it in our country, where we have leaders who take, 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 take. And people who suffer as a result of that taking. Now the elders, what would they do with that warning? Well, they chose to ignore it because it was against what they wanted. Look at verse 19. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. Hadn't they seen God fight their battle earlier in chapter seven when he thundered from heaven? But they conveniently had forgotten about that. Verse 21, when Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. Again, he goes to God. That's what leaders need to do. Godly leaders go to God. Verse 22, the Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, everyone go back to his own town. He said, go home. I don't know whether they thought he would sort of produce a king immediately, but he uh, said, the Lord will give you a king, go home. So they got what they asked for. But in giving them a king, God was not giving them something as an act of grace. He was giving them a king as an act of judgment. Later on, the prophet Hosea, God said in Hosea 13, 11, so in my anger, I gave you a king. That was God's assessment. You demanded a king like the other nations. God says, in my anger, I gave you a king. The day after Donald Trump was elected president of the US, the renowned pastor John Piper wrote a blog with the title, In My Anger, I Gave You a King. And time will tell whether those words were prophetic. Warren Wiersbe said, sometimes the greatest judgment God can give us is to let us have our own way. Psalm 106 verse 15 says, God gave them their request but sent leanness to their soul. Now this first section, as we think about the people rejecting the Lord, uh, 1 Samuel chapter eight is a mirror. It's a mirror that reveals you to you. It's a mirror that reveals me to me. In chapter eight, we see how easily we misplace our trust. What was Israel doing here? Rather than trust in the person and the promises of the unseen God, they wanted a king with skin on. They wanted a king like the other nations who could lead them into battle. And how easily do we misplace our trust? How, easily, how easy do we find it to, rather than trust in God, in his person, in his promises, in his track record, how easily do we put our trust in, in human things, in people, in programs, in strategy, in money? We do that in our personal lives, we do it in our family life, we can do it in church life, we can do it in business life. And God kind of gets pushed to the side and we want a human solution to our problems. Another thing that strikes me here in, which, in, in another way in which this passage is kind of a mirror is it shows us how ashamed we are to be different. 
They wanted a king like the other nations. They wanted to be like everybody else. And don't we feel the pressure as people, don't we feel the pressure as a church to be like everybody else, to conform to the world, to copy the world in our methods, in our behavior. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, do not be like them. The whole Sermon on the Mount presents us with a, a countercultural way of life. The world behaves this way. Jesus said, don't be like them. Later on, Paul said, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We battle to be different. And yet the call to discipleship is a call to be different. And then a third thing that strikes me is how resistant we are to any word from God that does not agree with our opinion. Despite God's clear warning through Samuel of the cost of them having that kind of a king, they said, no, we want a king. No, we want a king. And how often do we, do we find that, not only with people who may not claim to be followers of Christ, but even with among those who do, where God's word is clear on a particular thing, and our answer is no, we want to do it a different way. It's true when it comes to business ethics. I know what God says, but everybody's doing it. I want to do it that way. When it comes to issues of premarital sex, or divorce, or homosexuality, or gay marriage, this is what the Bible says, but no, we want to do it a different way. And sometimes God says, okay, do it your way but pay the price. And the price doesn't always come the next day. So let's turn our attention now from the people who rejected the Lord to the prophet who obeyed the Lord. And uh, this is a long section from chapter nine, verse one, through to chapter 10, verse 27. And the section reaches a climax in chapter 10, verse 24, where Samuel said to all the people, do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. And the people shouted, long live the king. This happened at Mizpah. We've heard of Mizpah before. This was another Mizpah moment. That was the climax of the process that begins in chapter nine, verse one. Long live the king. But the climax was reached by successive steps in which Samuel, as the spiritual leader of Israel, followed the Lord's instructions. And his obedience to the Lord, his listening to the Lord, his prayerfulness is such a challenge to those of us in Christian leadership and indeed to all of us. And we need to follow his example. Even though what the people wanted displeased him, the fact that God had said, I'm gonna give them a king. I'm going to say yes to their request. Samuel follows through with that and he obeys God. And we see in successive steps this rolling out until the king is presented. So in this part of the story, it's broken up into three areas. First of all, Samuel providentially meets Saul. And then Samuel secretly anoints Saul as king. Just the two of them. He anoints him as king. And then finally, in verse 17 to 27, he presents Saul to the people, and that's when they acclaim him. Long live the king. Now, we don't have time to uh, look at every part of this section, but for your encouragement as individuals and for our encouragement as a church, I want us to just look for a few minutes at Chapter nine, verses one to 25, the, the part of the story where 
Samuel providentially meets Saul. How did Samuel meet this man that God had chosen to be king? And it's a, it's a fascinating story, and it's a story that illustrates the providence of God. The providence of God is God's way of providing for his people. When we talk about the providence of God, that's what we're talking about, God's way of providing for his people. Ralph Davis says, it is that wonderful, strange, mysterious, unguessable way that the Lord has of ruling his world and sustaining his people. And he's doing it frequently, over, under, around, through, or in spite of the most common stuff in our lives and even the bias of our wills. I like that. God's providence is God's way of providing for the needs of his people. And in this section, we see the providence of God. Now, rather than read the story, let me, let me try to just quickly tell you the story. As we step into chapter nine, we're introduced to a farmer by the name of Kish, who was of the tribe of Benjamin. And he had a son whose name was Saul. And we're told that Saul was very handsome and that he was head and shoulders taller than any other Israelite. Now Saul, I mean, Kish was a farmer who had donkeys. And one morning he woke up and one of the servants came to him and said, boss, sorry, uh, something happened in the night. The donkeys got out and they're gone. And so Kish called his handsome hunk of a son, Saul, and he said, get one of the servants and please go after the donkeys. And so uh, mom packed them a lunch and, uh, and off they went hunting for these lost donkeys. And they started off looking all around Blair Gowrie and they didn't find the donkeys in Blair Gowrie. And then they moved into Craig Hall and they didn't find the donkeys in Craig Hall and then they went up to Dunkeld and they didn't find the donkeys in Dunkeld. And then they went on to Rosebank and they searched high and low in Rosebank and the donkeys weren't in Rosebank. And uh, by that time, Saul was, was tired and he said to the servant, uh, why don't we just go home? Um, you know, soon dad's gonna be forget, he's gonna forget about the donkeys and he's gonna be worrying about us. But the servant said, no, no, no. Um, Let's, let's press on because I know that in Saxonwald there is a prophet and what he says comes true and his counsel is wise. Let's press on and ask him for guidance as to where these donkeys might be. And Saul said, no, we, we, we can't do that. You know, if we're gonna ask him a favor as a prophet, we have to have something to give him and we've eaten all our lunch. Uh, we don't have anything to give him, so we can't do that. And the servant said, oh, don't you worry. I took out his wallet and he said, I have got half a silver shekel in my wallet and so we've got something to give to the prophet when we ask his help. And so Saul said, good. And so they pressed on into Saxonwald and Saxonwald happened to be the area where the prophet Samuel lived in the town of Ramah. And as they came to the town, they met a bunch of young girls coming out of town to the well to fill up their water jars with water. And when those young girls saw Saul, head and shoulders above everybody else, this handsome hunk, they said, wow, how can we help you? It's not actually in the text, I just made that up. <laughs> but I, I can imagine that that would have happened. And so Saul and the servant said, we're looking for the man of God. We're looking for the prophet. And the girl said, oh, we know exactly where he is. We'll take you to him. In fact, he's planning a feast at a certain place in the town. He's gonna to offer sacrifices. And uh, so come with us. And they took Saul and the servant right up to where Samuel was. They met him 
And when Samuel saw Saul, this is what he said. Or the Lord said to him, this is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern or lead Israel. So unbeknown to Saul, God was in the details of that donkey search to bring Saul and Samuel together so that he could be anointed and then proclaimed as king to Israel. Do you see the, the providence of God in the details of that day or they may even have stretched over more than one day. The donkeys got lost. In the life of the farmer, that's not a big deal. It happens. Fences break, cattle get away, donkeys get lost. Kish nominated Saul to go and look for the donkeys. Maybe he had other sons that he could have picked, but he chose Saul. Saul chose that particular servant who seems to have been a pretty savvy and determined guy. He was not prepared to give up when Saul was ready to go home when they were in Rosebank. He's the one who suggested they press on and find the prophet in Saxonville. Their unsuccessful search led them to the district of Zuf, where the town of Rama was, where Samuel lived. When Saul wanted to give up, the servant happened to know about Samuel, the man of God. It seems that Saul didn't know about it, so, but that servant knew. Was that an accident? No, that was divine providence. When Saul hesitated because they had nothing to give, the guy had money in his pocket. Then they met the girls who knew exactly where Samuel was. You see, the hand of God. And then Samuel would look back and say, God, you were in all of those details. And in fact, the day before, look at verse 15. Chapter 10, verse 15, the day before, this is what happened. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him leader over my people Israel, he will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. I've looked upon my people for their cry has reached me early. The mercy of God despite the stubbornness and rejection by his people. I want to ask you, are you aware of the providential control of God in the small details of your life? Do you believe that God is in the details? Sometimes it's only as we look back we recognize that this happened and that happened and I met that person and, and we look back and we realize that God has been in the details. God has been in the search for the lost donkeys. We don't always see it at the time. It's, it's just something that happens. But over and above those things, we have a God who is in control and who is in all things working for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. We sometimes sing that new song by Chris Tomlin, sovereign in the mountain air, sovereign on the ocean floor, with me in the calm, with me in the storm, sovereign in my greatest joy, Sovereign in my deepest cry, with me in the dark, with me at the dawn. And then this, in your everlasting arms, all the pieces of my life from beginning to the end, I can trust you. In your never failing love, you work everything for good. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. And this story, this first part of the story, just highlights that amazing truth of the, of the providence of God. 
Now, after Samuel providentially met Saul, he anointed him secretly, and then he called the people together at Mizpah, and he presented Saul to them publicly. You can read the, the rest of the story. I hope you will. I hope you'll read chapters 8 to 11 from beginning to end. Do that. That's your assignment for this afternoon. Uh, during tea at the cricket this afternoon, you just do that. Uh, there's time. But some skeptics, we're told, verse 27 of chapter 10, some skeptics, or scoundrels as they're called, jeeringly asked, how can this fellow save us? That was their response. How can this fellow save us? Oh, I mean, he may be a head and shoulders taller, he may be handsome, but how can he save us? Well, their question was about to be answered in chapter 11. And so let's move there and look just briefly at the king who at least initially served the Lord. I say initially because we'll see in the weeks to come that while Saul may have in some senses begun well, he ended really badly. And there's some lessons for us down the road. So after Saul was introduced to the nation as their king, if you look at chapter 11, verse 15, what did he do? He went back farming. He went back to the farm. Strange. But then a crisis in the nation happened that changed absolutely everything, that catapulted Saul into active leadership of the nation, and le leading to the conquest of an enemy and his joyful confirmation as king by the people. So let's read from verse one of chapter 11. Nahash the Ammonite, and Ammonites were on the east side of the river Jordan, the Philistines were on the west, on the Mediterranean coast. The Ammonites were east of the Jordan. Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said to him, make a treaty with us. Jabesh Gilead was part of Israel, part of the tribe of Manasseh. They said, make a treaty with us and we will be subject to you. That was their response. They knew they couldn't, that they couldn't defeat Nahash. But Nahash, verse two, Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and so bring disgrace to all Israel. What a horrific thing. There was a military reason for that that I don't have time to go into. Soldiers with a missing right eye and the way they operated in formation would be just totally uh, dysfunctional. The elders of Jabesh, verse three, said to him, give us seven days so we can send messengers throughout Israel and if no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. Bit of a strange thing, but, I, but uh, uh, Nahash was so confident he was just toying with them. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, that was the area where Saul was farming and reported these terms to the people that this is what Nahash had demanded. Unless we go to help him, every one of them is gonna have their right eye gouged out. When they, when they heard this, they all wept aloud. Verse five, just then Saul was returning from his fields behind his oxen. Like I said, he'd gone back to farming. And he asked, what's wrong with the people? Why are they weeping? They then, then they repeated to him what the men of Jabesh had said. Now look at verse six. When Saul heard their words, the spirit of God came upon him. In fact, it's a strong word there. It's more like the spirit of God rushed upon him. When Saul heard their words, the spirit of God rushed upon him in power and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel proclaiming, this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people 
and they turned out as one man. When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000, and the men of Judah, 30,000. They told the messengers who had come, say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, by the time the sun is hot tomorrow, you will be delivered. And when the messengers went and reported this to the men of Jabesh, they were elated. And they said to the Ammonites, to Nahash, tomorrow we will surrender to you and you can do to us whatever seems good to you. You can gouge your eyes out tomorrow. The next day, verse 11, Saul separated his men into three divisions and during the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Whew. What has this got to do with us? It's a bloody, bizarre Old Testament battle. What can we learn from this? by way of application to our evangelistic efforts, our attempts to, because the theme of this chapter is rescue. Who's gonna rescue these people from this terrible enemy? That's the, that's the key word in chapter 11. The evangelistic effort of the church involves rescuing people from the clutches of the enemy, delivering them. That's what the gospel is. It's a message of salvation. It's a message of rescue. It's a message of deliverance. John Woodhouse writes, behind the warfare language of the New Testament, and do you realize there is a lot of warfare language in the New Testament? Ephesians chapter six, for example, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, Paul says, but against the spiritual, he uses warfare language all over the New Testament. It's not cruel for the church to use warfare language anymore. We tend to use commercial language. We want to increase our market share. We want to advertise Jesus. Uh, We don't use warfare language. It's uh, It's not cruel, but it's very, very biblical. We come back to this quote from John Woodhouse. Behind the warfare language of the New Testament, we need to see the actual warfare of the Old Testament. Just as we should look to the Old Testament to understand the New Testament language of sacrifice, of election, of redemption, and much more, we ought to see the language of war associated with the Christian gospel against its necessary and clarifying background in the Old Testament. Now, what is he saying? He's saying that just as God's spirit came upon Saul to stir him with anger and passion just as God's spirit moved in that nation so that the men rallied as one man to take on this enemy that was determined to defeat and dismember God's people and disgrace God's name, just as God's spirit did that in a physical sense. So when it comes to rescuing people from the enemy of our souls, from the devil. God's spirit is given to his church to empower us and enable us and to stir us to go with the gospel, which is the only thing that God uses to bring people out of darkness into his wonderful light. And that's the challenge of this passage. When the battle against Nahash and his forces was won, Saul acknowledged, look at verse 13, Saul acknowledged, this day the Lord has rescued Israel. 
And only the Lord can rescue a person from the kingdom of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of his dear son. And we're involved as a church, as Christians, in that battle. And a battle it is. And God has chosen to do it through people like Saul, through ordinary people, through a, through a farmer that he empowered by his spirit, that he stirred by his spirit. And what can we say? Our great need as a church, our great need as believers is to realize that we are involved in a war. The Bible college Irene and I attended in the era that we attended back in the 60s and the 70s, the motto of the college was training disciplined soldiers for Christ. Our principal wrote a book called World Missions, Total War. We don't use those terms anymore. We used to sing hymns like, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep or the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. We need to get back to that sense of urgency and see the church as being on a war footing with the responsibility of rescuing people who are held by the enemy intent on their destruction and God's dishonor. And it comes back to me saying, oh God, give me your spirit. Fill me with your spirit that where I live, work, and play, I might be in some way your instrument to rescue somebody through showing them the gospel in my life and sharing the gospel with my words and praying like crazy that they would be brought by God's grace, into his kingdom. Will you ask God to do that for you? Will you ask God to do that for us as a church? When the spirit of God came on Saul, he burned with anger. It riled him to think of these people, they're in the clutches of the enemy. I ask myself, I ask you, does it disturb us? Does it rile us to see people who don't know Christ headed for a Christless eternity, held by the enemy of our souls? Does it, does it disturb you or does it mark me, sock me? Oh God, stir me, oh stir me, Lord. I cannot how but stir my heart in passion for the world. Let's pray. Lord our God, we thank you for your word, this great section with all of its multifaceted application. By your spirit, Lord, take your word and apply it to our hearts and help us to live it out in our lives. We pray, oh God, for the rush of your spirit upon us, stirring us to holy anger and jealousy and action in seeking to bring people held in the grip of the enemy into the freedom and joy of Christ. Amen.